our relationship to nature is uh, undergoing some significant change. And the question is just how we think about that change uh, and how we think about ourselves in relationship to nature. So I'd like to just move on from that background question to the specifics of some of the situations that we find ourselves in. So should we see this move towards seeing nature as a god as potentially a dangerous step that undermines human values? Tim. Well, I think there is a potential danger, um, and, and I perhaps would even sort of draw on two things that were said just now. Um, you know, you, 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 you were talking about the Amazon and how the bulldozers came in and sort of destroyed the system, and although, already that puts a picture in your mind of this sort of man-made technology destroying the natural um, system. And I think Peter also said, you know, we're not going to solve our problems by technological fixes. And I certainly agree we're not going to solve them by technological fixes alone. But science and technology, I mean, the danger with, you know, Peter, you were talking about how Einstein was uh, rejected by his Jewish uh, religious uh, uh, people and, and, of course, Galileo and so on. So there, there's always this tension between... Uh, religion and theology and science and technology. It doesn't have to be intention, but historically it's always been. I think we cannot ignore science and technology uh, in facing the current, particularly environmental problems. Um, let me just give you, a, let me, I mean, it's a terribly practical, but let me give you an example, because there's a colleague of mine, Peter Edwards at the University of Oxford. Um, he's working on an ability to take waste plastic bombard it with microwave energy and, and basically rip the, the chemical uh, bonds apart and create hydrogen and sort of pure carbon. Okay, so now what could you do with this? Well, hydrogen, I'm sure people are aware, is a, is a potential energy vector, energy source, if you like, for replacing gas and oil and, and, and petrol and so on. So one proposal that we've made is that you could actually make steel. You all, I think, you know, you'll have, you've heard in the news about the, the coking coal plant in, in, the, in the Lake District, which is there to make coal, make, uh, sorry, make steel, coking coal to make steel. Well, okay, we can do this with waste plastic if we use this technology. We have the hydrogen to heat the iron ore. We then add the carbon from the plastic into the iron ore to make steel. So suddenly we've got a green way of making steel. This is technology um, solving one of, you know, steel is what we need to make buildings. There are many examples of this. So we, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't automatically tar science and technology uh, as, as bad and the sort of, you know, the natural world, the god of, of the earth or something is, is inherently good. There's got to be a synergy here moving forward, and it's clearly something which takes advantage of our special status as a highly creative um, species to do that. So that, that, you know, so I'm not against what you're saying, but I think there is a, a sort of a danger that elevating nature to this theological status, there is a danger that people will automatically then reject science and technology as a solution for our problems, and I think that would be a mistake. Okay, I'll just come to Peter in a moment. Melanie, uh, I mean, in uh, Bangladesh, the Supreme Court uh, gave rights to all rivers. And uh, one of the consequences of that were that farmers and fishers were immediately uh, asked to move from where they were, and they lost their livelihoods. So, do you think there's a danger in in uh, putting uh, nature up as having rights independently of us? Or do you think that is the right move and it was a right thing for those uh, farmers and fishers to have to move? I think, you know, it's imperfect. You know, that is the nature of the world that we have, that has been gifted us, if you like, um, by the chaos of, of of physics or whatever you want to, or a god, however you want to view it, um, we've inherited something as people and, and nature is absolutely 
a mixed bag in terms of outcomes. We're living right now, we've all been talking behind the scenes about how weird it is to all be here. I'm sure some of you might be feeling the same way. It's the first time I've come and talked to anyone live for like a year and a half. So all of us are a little bit raw. Because we're living in a pandemic, well, viruses are a key part of nature. My child was asking me the other day, you know, what say, where do viruses live? And I, we were right by the sea because I live by the sea. And I said, well, they're mostly in there. There are millions and millions and millions of them in there. And they've partly given us perhaps had a role in multicellularity. So this thing that is seen as horrible and frightening that we need to eliminate is a key part of nature. And it sometimes does things that are unpleasant, including to us. So nothing's a given in nature. But I think to go back to the concrete again about being in, in, in and no wonder given that, that we have sought belief systems that help us through the moral and psychological stresses that follow from that kind of chaotic nature. Nonetheless, the reality is we have to get down to some pragmatics. When you are in the situation where, and, and very often at the moment, what we're seeing is sticking plasters going over all of these things. So in rights of nature's cases, so what we might call wild law, we're seeing that coming out of indigenous rights movements quite often, people who were historically disenfranchised from the land, who have had no political voice whatsoever, who've often had, you know, been subject to land grabs, who are just getting by at the edges of, of any given state or nation, who are starting to come back and say, well, what you're describing in the world isn't our worldview. That's not how we situate ourselves with our resources. It's not how we manage our resources. And we want a political voice. And, you know, you can completely understand, no matter what you might think about it philosophically, you can see historically how that's come about. And it's solving that kind of historical mess. But then you've got the situation with the bulldozers. And I absolutely hear you. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm a total science consumer of science, you know, um, and I think science has a lot to do in giving us very good reasons to act, and it will have a lot to do in resolving problems. I mean, creating things, if you look at industrial history, can go any which way. You can end up with CFCs that you never saw coming in a big hole in the ozone. You can also fix the problem thereafter, or use science to understand the problem and, and track its uh, its amelioration over time, which is you know, what's happening in the Antarctic. So we need all of the tools available, but we always have to understand that the reason we're doing something is based on our value framework. And it's those value frameworks, I think, that we really need to make sense of. OK, thank you. So Peter, um, what do you say to those people who say this, uh, this move to seeing nature is God is, is dangerous? It's a threat to human agency. It's a threat to our values. What do you say to that? Um, well, maybe it is a threat. I mean, maybe an ecocentric point of view is a threat to humanity because it puts, if we really are to put humanity on a par with nature, then we have got no right to think of ourselves as special. This is dangerous to human beings, but, but one could say, um, um, helpful to nature as a whole. So there is, okay. cer there is certainly a conflict. I would not doubt it. Um, for example, population control. Yeah. So, so, so you'd say, uh, yeah, it's dangerous to human beings, but uh, that's, that's, it's the right thing to do. Well, no. I'd say <laughs> it depends on, uh, it really comes down to theory of morality, does it not? So do you value um, an anthropocentric um, morality, essentially, where values are placed um, on top as of the most value, or do you take an ecocentric morality? Um, now, of course, people can take their personal perspectives on this, but is there any theoretical way in which to distinguish? But that? you're, but but as I understand it, you think that we we should be uh, seeing uh, nature. Um, I, I think I think we have um, following our Christian legacy in the West, and the, you know, right from the Judeo-Christian legacy, seeing you know, um, the universe created for man, you know, in Genesis and so on, um, as having dominion over the earth. There has always been intrinsically, subconsciously, this valuation of humanity above nature. Nature is made for us. Okay, we're stewards of it as well, but essentially we are on top. Um, and this undercurrent has um, flown through um, 
many moralities until Hans Jonas, like I said, says we need to think about more ecocentric values. How do you, how do you ground values? How do you make this balance? Uh, this is an interesting question. I mean, for Spinoza, I'm not saying I agree with Spinoza here, but essentially, ultimately, might is right. So um, what people value is what's good for them. And if they can control a place, then they will do that, and the values will reflect that. The question really is, are, do there exist transcendent values, an ideal good towards which we could understand whether anthropocentrism as opposed to ecocentrism um, is, is right or wrong. Now, Spinoza, of course, was not a transcendentalist. God was nature. There was nothing outside of nature. So ultimately, I would say that if you, my argument would be, if you want to value humanity above anything else in nature, you have to make a very good argument for there being some form of transcendent mm. valuation. And where do you stand on that, though? I think there is no transcendent valuation. Okay. Therefore, there is no answer. There's no, there's no fact of the matter as to whether anthropocentric as opposed to ecocentric values are better or worse. This is like tea or coffee. There's, there's no fact of the matter what's better. Uh, I would say, though, as a human myself, obviously, I have a subjective preference <laughs> for um, you know, saving my fellow uh, humans. Um, but I see that as subjective. Ultimately, there's no, there's no fact of the matter. Okay. So, yeah. Tim. Well, could I, I mean, it seems to me it's a slightly false dichotomy, this anthropo versus ecocentric, because what we understand now is that the biosphere... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.